I should begin by um, with a couple of disclaimers. I, I, I think, you know, as an anthropologist, you know, sometimes you like to say, you know, any reference to people living or dead is purely circumstantial and should not be taken. That's quite hard when you're actually um, basing your research on empirical fieldwork in specific locations. So, um, so any reference to universities living or dead is uh, purely circumstantial and should not be taken as a. I mean, here. The slide, I originally um, prepared this, it was a talk for, um, I've written this as a chapter for a book called Symbiotic Anthropologies. And the aim of the, I mean, symbiosis has become quite a big theme in, in sort of multi-species ethnography. And, uh, but I, my paper was a contribution to, uh, to really to, to challenging some of the assumptions behind the, the, the use, or, or, or if you like, the, the, the misuse of kind of ecological organic metaphors, so my biological anthropology colleagues here might, might appreciate some of this. Um, uh, so it's bringing together uh, quite a, a, a number of strands of research that, that I've had over the last 10 years, some of it in, in the topic of university, changing systems of management within the university. I've been increasingly in, involved in projects looking at um, the, the reform of higher education um, in Europe, and of course, uh, Australasia, uh, the comparative one, and the rise of what is sometimes called the third mission. I'll explain what that means. So apologies in advance if I'm trying to, to cover too much. Let me begin by framing everything, though. Um, one of the, the, the most visible ways that universities are, are being transformed in the, the so-called global knowledge economy is the, the emphasis that many now place on the idea of promoting innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, and links with sort of business and, and commerce as a, a core part of, of their mission. And, and this has occurred in parallel with a whole raft of other key changes in the political economy of higher education um, as a result of various reforms. And you'll be familiar with all of these, so let me understand. So what we've seen is um, the withdrawal of state support for public education, for higher education, a privileging of the STEM subjects over the arts and the humanities, um, the, um, what little public funding that remains is reoriented around the concepts of impact or uh, investment or um, c commercial value of the research. And by the way, Japan a few months ago became one of the more the, the latest OECD countries to withdraw all public funding for university students wishing to study in the arts, the humanities, and social sciences. So it's uh, the STEM subjects are the only ones that are really being publicly funded now. Uh, rising fees and corresponding to that, of course, rising levels of student debt uh, and a proliferation of new regimes of audit and accountability that are you know, administratively run uh, bearing down on us and some would say you know the death of the public university uh, Vernon James Vernon but maybe in the case of the United Kingdom uh, where I have been living last year I think that we see one of the, the most extreme versions of this um, but um, Universities have sort of found themselves recast sort of structurally and discursively as um, transnational corporations operating in a global knowledge economy rather than as we maybe once understood them as public institutions uh, with a, a social and a critical mission. And the value of a university degree has been redefined as a personal private investment in one's individual career rather than as it maybe once was conceived of in the post-war period as a sort of a, a social, valuable social investment for citizenship and for, for servicing certain needs of, of the nation. Now, there have been a number of attempts to, to capture these trends theoretically. Um, and anyone in, who, in here who's from education will know these debates really well. Simon Marginson and, and Considine's concept of the, uh, the entrepreneurial university model. My own preference, I like Leslie Slaughter's kind of uh, epithet academic capitalism. Um, but whatever the, the, the epithet or the theory, what all of these uh, processes involved is really an opening up of higher education and the university for business and for sort of commercial uh, interests. And I'll explain exactly what I mean as we go along. But um, so in countries like Britain, Australia, and New Zealand, academics are being um, urged to, um, to take on a more entrepreneurial subjectivity, to focus on impact, to engage more proactively with business and commerce in order to create more commercially oriented 
innovation ecosystems. And you see this phrase being banded around quite frequently now. The idea is that uh, um, you have a triple helix of connections that intertwine government, the private sector, uh, funders, uh, industry, and academia uh, in this kind of helix. And you know, the University of Surrey, the triple helix. Oh, New Zealand's innovation ecosystem by Sean Hendy and the McDiamond uh, Institute. So our own department, uh, physics department, is very much engaged in this. And Peter Gluckman, our former chief science advisor, has been uh, advocating this sort of idea of creating innovation hubs. But again, I, I'd step back at this and notice that the, so this idea that there's a positive symbiosis between these different sectors of society to create something organically beneficial. It's this metaphor of the helix. And of course, it has an obvious reference to the double helix, the stuff of life itself. Uh, there are other associations. Historically, anyone working in Italy will know that uh, attempts to introduce a corporatization that involved business academia and government um, in the 1930s. It went under a very different moniker, but I, we, won't, we won't go and make those historical parallels with what uh, Mr. Mussolini was up to. Um, so what we see is the rise of the third mission and the entrepreneurial university. Now, these trends are often captured in, in this epithet. It, the, the word, I think the term originally was coined in the United Kingdom. And um, it, it, it simply refers to, and I quote, the range of research and educational activities that universities carry out with their wider publics, from technology transfer to cult consultancy to contract research and community outreach. That's the, the kind of the, the main the standard definition. So it's about universities facing outwards, engaging with their stakeholders and the communities, some of whom are in the, you know, the communities, uh, not all in business. Um, now, there is nothing new about universities facing outwards and engaging with uh, you know, re relationships with business and commerce. And you think about you know, going back to the 1930s, Stanford University had a long connection with high-tech industries. It was part of the reason why Silicon Valley took off. I think uh, the University of Wisconsin, if I'm right, markets, they patented uh, warfarin. You know, blood thinner, uh, rat poison for most of us, but warfarin has fueled and funded so much of the prosperity of the University of Wisconsin because the patent was given over to the university uh, in a not for profit way. Um, so, nothing new about that. What is new is simply the extent to which these business university links have been extended and institutionalized and normalized. Uh, so they're not, no longer peripheral, they're much more prevalent. By the way, in New Zealand, in the UK, where the, where the moniker Third Mission was coined, it did mean something quite expansive. It wasn't simply about partnering with commerce and industry. New Zealand, our government has taken a much more narrow uh, definition, and it's looking at um, the Third Mission much more focused in terms of commercial uh, impact and, and dollars generated, uh, revenue from these entrepreneurial activities. Um, so some of the questions I, I was trying to uh, address were, well, what impact is this emphasis on the third mission having? Uh, how is it changing the public university? There's a side question here. Well, what exactly is academic entrepreneurialism? Strictly speaking, I'll turn to that in a sec. How is this symbiosis reshaping academia? And what new kinds of subjects is this model engendering? Is it a relationship of symbiosis or, or a much more parasitical and predatory one? Hence my suggested metaphor. This is a moray eel and a, I think the shrimp apparently cleans its teeth. <laughs> it's, not, it's not dinner for the moray eel, it's a, and it's supposed to you know, show how in, in, in the natural environment these symbiotic relationships are you know, a win-win from both sides. What can an ethnographic approach, or what can my discipline bring to these debates about the future of the university in an age of academic capitalism? Um, and as I say, my aside, well, isn't academic entrepreneur a bit of a contradiction in terms? I say that because the word entrepreneur comes from a, a French word um, meaning 
entreprendre, to, to undertake. And, and the, most of the definitions you, you'll find if you turn to the Dictionary of Economics or Finance, it all say something like, an individual who undertakes to supply a good or service to the market for profit, or a person with overall responsibility for decision-making in a business who receives any profits and who bears any losses. Entrepreneurs need not necessarily contribute either labor, which can be hired, or finance capital, which can be borrowed, but they must contribute either one of these or a credible guarantee if their responsibility for possible losses is to be genuine. So that made me think, well, in a university, when we're all being encouraged to be entrepreneurs, who bears the loss? Are we actually staking our own finances in these ventures? Well, not quite. Um, which then made me think, well, you know, there's, there's the Schumpeterian approach to the, the, the idea, the Schumpeterian hero of the, the entrepreneur, is, um, which is a much more expansive social science definition, which is as someone, a person who's willing to convert a new idea into an innovation, who embodies qualities of self-reliance and strives for distinction through excellence. And I think this is much more what is entailed. Although, beware, because Schumpeter was also the person who spoke enthusiastically about, quote, the gale of creative destruction that entrepreneurs are supposed to wreak in the organizations that they are uh, benefiting from. And I actually think a better word is, is intrapreneur, but that's, a, that's another time for a, another debate. So more context. Now, what is really interesting for, for, for the debate that's been taking place in, in higher education studies is that in the past, the key theorists of, of, of university reform mostly came from the left. Uh, and they were tended to be rather gloomy. I mean, uh, you had left-wing intellectuals who dominated this debate, like uh, Leotard, uh, the, the report on, on knowledge. Uh, Bill Reddings wrote a famous book, fantastic book, called The University in Ruins. This is in the 90s. And then you had Slaughter and Leslie writing about ac academic uh, capitalism. But what we see now, in the last 10 years, is an, a, a, a slew of reports that are being produced by think tanks, um, policy wallers, and um, external consultancies, very often, that are very much positioned on the right. And their message is really one of, of a prophecy of doom and gloom for the public university as we know it. Um, here are some of the kind of key phrases. So th there's an Ernst and Young report, I'm going to talk about that in a second, which talks about a revolution is taking place in higher education. According to uh, a Pearson report, a, an avalanche of change is upon us and will sweep the old system away. We're facing a tsunami of change and a disruptive innovation uh, that's forcing us all to rethink the existing model. And if you want to a good example of this, a brilliant example of this, look at no further than Australia. Now, the Australian universities commissioned a report from Ernst & Young by a team led by Bocor, uh, and, to, and it was called University of the Future. I love the, the, the ethnic moniker here, a thousand-year-old industry on the cusp of profound <coughs> change. And the argument of this you know, lengthy report produced by one of the big four international accountancy firms that they get everywhere, uh, is that, and I quote, the current Australian model, a broad-based teaching and research institute with a large base of assets and back off office, will prove unviable in all but a few cases. Um, so it's a prophetic tone. And then they go on to say, this is the prognosis, what will happen? Private providers, they say, will carve out new opportunities. Note this metaphor of carving. It literally means to divide by cutting up into pieces. Um, new positions in the traditional sector and also create new market spaces that emerge, that merge parts of the higher education sector with other sectors, such as media, technology, innovation, venture capital, and the like. And it goes on to say, exciting times are ahead. Um, but... Um, so the language of the report is a mix of threats, but also possible opportunities. And uh, higher education is seen, quote, as one of the main drivers of Australia's economic future, as a key source of talent, insight, new ideas, and intellectual property required to build a high-performing knowledge economy. And then it goes on and says, um, universities should assess if their current model is future-proof. I'd like to know what that word actually means. I'm future-proofing my, my house or something. Uh, 
and if not, determine where and how to play the future. Ernst and Young is uniquely placed to assist in this deliberation. <laughs> oh, well, that's handy. That's good to know. Um, another kind of example. This was a year later. Um, the supposedly middling Blairite think tank, the Institute for Pol Public Policy Research in, the, in London, commissioned a report by Michael Barber et al. Sorry, I should preface that. Sir Michael Barber. He's been knighted. Um, the report... <coughs> There's a glossy booklet, and it's, its argument is called An Avalanche is Coming. And the argument goes like this. It says, traditional models of higher education are broken. The next 50 years may see a golden age for higher education, but only if all the players in the system, from students to governments, seize the initiative and act ambitiously. If not, an avalanche of change will sweep the whole system away. We've entered, they go, this goes on, I'm quoting from the report. We've entered a new global era characterized by accelerated innovation, wearable computing, driverless cars, biotech revolutions. Within this new world, the traditional idea of the university has reached its apotheosis. Universities are increasingly threatened. Modern communications technologies and MOOCs have severed the traditional relationship between higher education and place. Students are increasingly mobile. Courses can now be streamed via MOOCs, and the student consumer is king. I bet you don't feel like you're king or queen in your <laughs> student room, but apparently you are. And there you go. You're, you're empowered. So what's the solution? This is, fact, this is where it gets, the plot gets really intriguing. Unbundling the university's value chain. So what the, what the report does, and the, this analyst, they basically divide up the university into 10 core functions and these functions are research, awarding degrees, the prosperity that we bring to the cities, faculty staffing, students, governance and administration, curricular teaching and learning assessment, and the student experience. And the, the report argues that all of these, maybe with the exception of you know, overall governance, I don't think we'd outsource the vice chancellor or the senior leadership team, maybe not, but all of these, it argues, could be outsourced uh, to private providers who can provide these services more cheaply and more efficiently. So why shouldn't we go there? Um, and it goes on, as the monopoly over awarding degrees breaks down, universities need to reconsider their true value. What is absolutely intriguing about this report, and it goes on, and uh, I'll say a little bit more, is that the preface is written by Larry Summers. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's nods of recognition, who was Provost, director of Harvard University and an economics advisor under Clinton. Quite a maverick character, but he gives the game away right in the preface. He, at the end of his preface, he says, those who rebundle will find that they have reinvented higher education for the 21st century. So the aim of unbundling, disassembling, is to rebundle. And then you, ye who rebundles, will find that you have reinvented the sector for the next century, or this century. And then they go on to predict the future of the university. Well, basically, universities in the future will fall into one of five categories. And at the top of the, the pyramid, you've got the elite university, which has a global brand, strong endowment, stellar track record, gets the lion's share of prestigious funding and research grants. You know, these, these are the Harvards, the Princetons, the Oxbridges, and <laughs> the Melbourne, the Auckland University, who knows? I mean, somebody wants to compare us to the Princeton of the Pacific. I seem to remember that label. Then you have the mass university, which provides to the, the growing global mass middle class and others, and that's probably more what most of the universities fall into. Then you have the niche universities. I'm thinking here of the East Coast of the United States, those liberal arts colleges, Swarthmore and, and places which have very small numbers, high fee pay, specialise in, in yeah, usually arty subjects. Then you have the local university, mid to low tier, serves the local, the regional economy. And I like the one at the end, the lifelong learning mechanism. <laughs> Non-university institutes with degree accrediting powers, they don't even merit the word university. Oh, where did you get your degree from? Well, I got it from the lifelong learning mechanism over, over Waikato or something. It <laughs> doesn't really say much, does it? It's like a, so, then you step back and say, well, hang on, so this, this is an intriguing report with a great deal of status, but who are the authors? Well, uh, Michael Barber is the author, Sir Michael Barber, um, but the, 
Pearson's uh, educational are the people who fund Michael Barber's salary. He's employed by them, and the team came from Pearson's. Now, Pearson's is a British multinational publishing and educational company headquartered in London. It's the largest educational company and the largest, I think it it might have sold off its book book publishing. I'm not sure, I'm a bit out of date. Um, They did, yeah, so they're consolidating. Yeah, but they're, okay, they're losing money in there. But they they did own the whole of the Financial Times Group, the Economist, uh, King uh, Dorling Kindersley. They had a, a a listing, a primary listing on the London Sto- Stock Exchange, and they are a constituent of the F. Uh, FTSE, the Financial Times, what is it, uh, um, Securities and Exchange um, Index, and a secondary listing on the New York Stock Exchange. It also has a, a, a huge stake, a growing stake in the production and ownership of school textbooks, and of course, examinations. Rebundling, you're capturing every area of the market. You produce the, the text, you produce the, you publish the, the works, you produce the exams, the, the examinating boards. And now you try to capture the universities that can then offer the the degrees themselves. So here, it's a great example of of this process. By the way, when I I looked at it, it, my friends and I in the education department, we were looking at this and thinking, so this is the team that produced the report. And sorry, I know I'm getting old and policemen look younger, but they all look like they're just sort of 23 and straight out of a a BA, you know, in BCom or something. Uh, Very young people who, you know, writing about the future of higher education when... I'm sure their collective wisdom is not that, that grand. Or uh, You do wonder, what is the qualifications of Ernst & Young or Pearson's to, to write about these serious matters? So what are the implications of the uh, Barber Report? Well, is it a blueprint for asset stripping? Uh, it's about releasing the rents, and universities, higher education is a rich source of profitability. There's huge amount of rent are just locked up in the university. Everything from the providing conference services to catering to student accommodation to, you know, this, there's money to be made and global capital, finance <coughs> capital is looking for places to, to reap those rewards. Uh, and if you capture an asset, what do you do with it if you're a financier? Well, you, you sweat the asset. You try to get as much from it as you can. So it's about financialising the assets and um, yeah, and it's and stripping them, rebundling them under new regimes of ownership and control. And it's couched, curiously, it's couched in this bizarre language of futures and futurology. Um, what it really does, these reports, they're di- they, they purport to be diagnosing the system and, and predicting the future. But actually, they're very much engines for producing the, the diagnoses that they predict. You know, they put it out there and say, this is what's happening. And actually, in doing so, they, they help to make it happen. This is what Ian Hacking would call dynamic nominalism. By naming something, you try to create it as a social fact on the ground. Um, and we've seen lots of evidence of this before. George H.G. Uh, Wells or the UK had a foresight program in, in the 1990s. Um, so what, at this point, what I want to do is shift gear a bit and talk about um, a, a, an empirical research project that I've been involved with. And um, part of it was, uh, it was one of these cross cross-faculty research initiative projects and I did with uh, Nick Lewis in geography and Nigel Howarth in business and John Morgan in education and we we had about a year 18 months where we decided to map the third mission in all of New Zealand's eight universities and so we we did a whole series of site visits to uh, uh, across the sector we, we went down to every university and spoke to their <coughs> deputy vice chancellors we spoke to their commercializing uh, unit technology transfer offices and and sometimes to students um, and this is just a kind of an overview of the sector so we've got eight universities although yeah, I'm sure that the, uh, the productivity commission would like us to have many more private ones um, There's a close relationship between universities and the state, and there's a long history of government attempts to diversify exports into high value-added products based on innovation and and a well-educated workforce. So we put a premium on students going through higher education because we see ourselves as part of a a knowledge economy. But even in its purest neoliberal phase, and and Jane Kelsey and others talk about New Zealand being the laboratory for neoliberal experimentations, even in the height of that, the 80s and so on, the state had always intervened in higher education to promote 
diversification, you know, growth, R&D funding, uh, investments and incentives and so on. So, and the abiding feature of the period has now become the branding of New Zealand as a, as a small, diverse, yet innovative and developed economy, often captured in that wonderful moniker, the NZ Inc. approach which they stole from Japan, but we are all, we're all in this waka together, NZ Inc. And this is why we, you know, industry, venture capitalists, universities, we, we are all on the same side and that's what we must do. Um, universities, as a result, were, have increasingly been funded in, re, in relation to their potential contribution to economic development. And so they continuously have to subject themselves to uh, internal reorganizations that meet that driver an investment approach to higher education now. And beyond calls to exploit research, universities are subject to growing pressure to demonstrate the relevance and the impact and the applicability of their teaching programs. How is this servicing employers? How is it servicing the economy? Um, and since the 1990s, there's been huge pressure on universities to deliver. I mean, this is actually there explicitly written in tech uh, reports and plans, universities are funded in order to deliver a return on investment. But the question is, well, how immediate does that return have to be? And I think, you know, the fact that we only have three-year government cycles means that the short-termism is written into the script very often. Um, so, um, so mapping the third mission. Yeah, so this is how we, we went around and visited all the, the places where we saw, uh, wondered what the universities in New Zealand were doing to embrace this new initiative. Um, what do we find? Let me just summarise. I've got nine things, findings, and they kind of capture sort of what maybe you're all familiar with, really, but maybe this is a way of, of putting it in a bracket. Um, every university in New Zealand uh, has sought to uh, create its own Technology transfer offices, TTOs, um, and you know this is where commercialization and entrepreneurship is very apparent. Uh, most cases, it's a recent phenomenon, post 1990s, except one, which is the University of Auckland Uni Services. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the role is still underdeveloped. Most are still working through different models. All of them seem to tell a story of promissory science, of breaking new ground, of pushing forward frontiers, of connecting the university with invest investors and creating new startups. Um, and all emerge out of the narrative of the failure of, of the traditional university and the need to unlock the commercial potential, either in our PhD students or in our own research. Um, and so you get the creation of research institutes. Um, well, Callaghan Innovation is the national one, but um, but the, everywhere, though, this one, where was it, NZ23, I think that was uh, Canterbury. Um, but I love this quote from Sir Paul Callaghan, 100 inspired entrepreneurs could turn this country around. As I say, there is this narrative of promissory science. It's the kind of the, uh, the, we're chasing the image that somehow, if we could discover, invent the killer app, then not only we will we generate huge profits, we will reboot the economy and our universities will flourish. The hunt for the killer app, that's it. Uh, and it's out there, but you know, we just haven't yet discovered it. So the rise of Auckland Uniservices Limited is a really fascinating case in point. I mean, if you just look at its own um, literature and its own websites, and we've interviewed many of the people there, uh, it has a number of incredibly impressive figures. Um, it's the most successful research commercialization unit of its kind. Here's its pro uh, promotional stuff, dedicated to connecting the university's capabilities to universities and investors, government and the community. It's this triple helix again, through, and then you go through. And um, largest, it claims to have over 600 employees. I think some of these are academics working in, in the, the day job, it may not be uni services, operating in over 37 countries, generating over half the University of Auckland's external revenue. My figures are a bit out of date, and this was, I think, 2015, and it had generated 130 million. Um, and so on. I, but I, what I find really interesting is that there, here we have a huge paradox. Uniservices is model is a business model. It's geared to maximizing the potential to make a profit. Now here's a conundrum. 
the University of Auckland is a registered charity, not-for-profit institution. And I quote, this is from the annual report. The university and its subsidiaries are exempt from the payment of income tax in New Zealand as they are treated as charitable organisations by the Inland Revenue Department, unquote. So how do you square an institution geared to profit in a bigger institution that is a charity? Well, I think it's a, one of the, a, a nice exemplar of what a Gambon would have called a state of exception. It's like the, it's the, the university equivalent to the, the offshore tax haven or the casino. It's a place where you can suspend the normal rules and morality and ethics and engage in behaviours that you couldn't do else. In fact, this was openly admitted to us by one person who I will not name, who said, oh yeah, well the reason why you know, we, the, the university likes this is that we can do things that the university can't. We can invest in certain things, not that we have a, an ethical investment policy anyway. Some of us have been trying to get disinvestment in fossil fuels, much to our chagrin, it hasn't happened. Um, but I, I wrote an article with one of our MA students, Laura McLaughlin, and we coined the phrase, we were laughing about this, and she, I think it was her phrase, she said, it's a bit like Camp Delta, isn't it? Said, That's it, it's the Guantanamo principle. You create a space where you can do things that are unethical, but you can get away with it because it's an exceptional space. Anyway, uh, I digress. Um, the other thing, the phenomenon you see right across all of these universities is the creation of new spaces for entrepreneurship. Um, a good example is Auckland University, and uh, we interviewed lots of the characters who, and the actors behind the creation of the, the Institute for Innovation in Biotechnology, which is that you know, wonderful glass and steel building, you know, the, the uber-modernist building uh, on the corner. Um, and according to its then director, Jörg Kissler, look, I love that photograph, you know, look, these are weird goggles that sort of, I think they enable you to see, and oh look, there you have it again, evolving ecosystem delivers on government biotech vision. Jörg put it quite succinctly, he said, well, the aim of the place, he said, there's only one entrance and exit, and it's all open plan, and the aim is to bring together PhD students, academics, venture capitalists, uh, researchers, and we create this sort of osmosis but I think they call it, in the, isn't it in business, they call it the sand pit. And, and there's through this intermingling and there's only one canteen, one exit. And so things will rub off. And he said, I see myself as really a, as a glorified estate manager. We rent out the space. Um, last thing I heard was that building is going to be um, converted to house the law school. Uh, the law school, the faculty of law will be moving into it. So that vision didn't quite pay off. Um, we have an endowed chair in entrepreneurship, one of the most highly preferred professors in the university, and uh, he was just retiring, so he was quite open. And he said, well, he said at the time we were trying to convince the government that this will work. Uh, he said, so um, they were skeptical, because we, I can't remember the government's contribution was about 12 million, um, but there is the minister, there's John Key, sorry, cutting the ribbon, opening up. He said, um, and at one point they were wavering, he said, so I, I leant forward on the table and I said, you know, he's saying, look, will it work? You know, will these spinning companies actually come? And he said, oh, and he leant forward. He said, he said, I leant forward and I looked at them, the minister, and I said, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> and everyone nodded very sagely. And he said to me, they didn't realise I was just quoting Robert Redfield from Field of Dreams. <laughs> uh, but he was. And... Uh, the other thing you see, and we're all aware of this, or maybe we're not because it's now filtering so much into the air that we breathe that it's become naturalised, you know, it's become doxer, as Bourdieu would put it. This change in language, we, we now have to articulate ourselves through the stifling verbal categories of the third mission. So we talk about investment as justifying expenses and our spending. Innovation, which is always un in in invariably positive, it's about releasing potential, unrealized, dormant talent. Entrepreneurship, you know, we, we put a prima on go-getting, uh, hungry for, uh, savvy, business savvy individuals. Excellent, of course, everything has to be excellent. You know, it's no good to be, a, you know, I'm campaigning for mediocrity. Uh, rock on, no. NZ Inc, quality, you know, there's a whole raft of them. But, but I, what is really interesting, and I'm not, we have, Mark and I have a shared interest in language, but I, I see these as keywords that when you put them together, 
they create new clusters, semantic clusters, and those semantic clusters are the bedrock of a very powerful ideology, and the ideology is very much a, a neoliberal one, um, geared to entrepreneurship and commercialization. But they, they work off each other, and they be, create an unassailable logic. Who can be against quality or excellence? How can you possibly complain about that? So you, it, it, it stifles dissent by its uh, seductive power. And then, of course, we see it in the rise of entrepreneurial teaching. We, we not only are we entrepreneurial in our, in our dispositions as academics and researchers, we're expected to inculcate the entrepreneurial subjectivity in our students. And we, what you see is the rise in the last few years in, in MAs in bioscience enterprise or postgraduate certificate in uh, masters in commercialization and entrepreneurship. Um, I've got a nice quote from them. It said, uh, um, it boasts, this is the M Bio Ent, the Master in Bioscience Enterprise. It says, it, it will bring together the worlds of business and science to create business savvy students who are comfortable operating in a business environment and who may give a company a cutting edge or be the key to a successful startup. This is how it's advertised. And the other, a couple of months ago, I took this photograph. This is on the library. Uh, entrepreneurship is a mindset, not an activity. Unleash your potential. I mean, in some ways that symbolizes, so I love symbols, I'm an anthropologist, but the, the epitome of a sort of, that's the library, and now we have to un, you know, have these adverts about the, the benefits of entrepreneurship being a mindset and how we should unleash our potential there. Um, oh yeah, here we go, this is what the, the, if you do the course, it promises that you will learn how to test and validate customer needs and market demand, protect intellectual property, obtain funding, and so on. And, you know, it's this, uh, this skill set that we're now trying to teach. Then, of course, the other obvious place where you see the entrepreneurial uh, commercialization uh, of the university is very much in, in the business schools. Our own business school is a case in point, um, the Owen Glenn building. Um, well, many people, I think if Stephen Turner were here, he'd written about this and Sean Sturm and others. But it's the building, if you, you know, not only do we pass a portrait of uh, Owen Glenn, who how much did he contribute to get the building named after him? Was it 12 million or something like that? And Decima Glenn building upstairs, his wife. Um, but downstairs, there's the Hall of Fame. And you walk past and you see all these sort of photographs of key New Zealand on... Well, they're key figures uh, like Sir Edmund Hillary, you know, with, and words, single words like drive, challenge, ingenuity. I don't know what Sir Edmund Hillary has got to do with the University of Auckland, or let alone the business school, but these are the, uh, the, the ethos. And then we have the annual Spark Prize for, uh, awarded to the young entrepreneur with quite substantial funds, uh, 100,000K. If you go to one of these evening events, it's a bit reminiscent of a Billy Graham revival meeting because uh, you get a, you know, like a, there'll be a, a, a young entrepreneur, uh, the one I went to, who was about 28 and he'd made millions with a, a, a simultaneous translation and he was prowling up and down the room like a hungry panther uh, and sort of explaining that, you, you know, entrepreneurship is a mindset, you know, and, it's a, and everyone is sort of nodding, yeah, rock on, I want to be like that. You also get the... Um, well, this, will, this is an event that takes place and will happen next week. Um, we have an annual ritual called Celebrating Research Excellence, and it will take place next week in the Marquee, and it's the time to recognise excellence in research in the university. But the highlight of the whole evening, the biggest award, in this case it was delivered by, the prize was delivered by the Honourable Stephen Joyce, our minister, um, is the... Vice-Chancellor's Medal for Excellence in Commercialization. So, you know, it's, it's, we're quite clear on where we are placing our priorities. That's another example. I don't think other universities have, have this. Um, now, there's another kind of whole area, but this is, this is the subject for a, a whole other article about how entrepreneurship and innovation and commercialization has seeped into uh, the academic standards policy. Um, many people, I think at the time when we were having uh, some major internal contradictory views on the academic standards framework, may not be aware that the new policy has a, a, a codicil, a subclause that attaches to a thing called the leadership framework. And the leadership framework, I, I think professional staff are maybe more familiar with this because it's in the evolving. And it has, it's based on a thing called 5D leadership. 
five dimensions and it was based on an Australian model. They flew over uh, an Australian management guru, uh, Scott Campbell from the University of Western Sydney, and they developed their own version, but we, we New Zealandized it, Maorified it, so that every leadership dimension had a little logo, like a, a waka, for the, and the, the core of it all was personal responsibility and distributed leadership. Um, but you'll find some of the terms of reference a little interesting. For example, under the heading setting direction, I think this is the one that uh, has the logo of the waka. And the document defines the ideal qualities of a leader as, quote, an individual who demonstrates an understanding of the competitive global environment and key market drivers and uses this understanding to create and seize opportunities, expand into new markets and deliver programs, displays behaviors of a leader who demonstrates global and commercial acumen, leads and inspires innovation, pursues ambitious ventures and advocates and clearly articulates the university's aspirations, objectives and values. Now, this has been incorporated into every staff member's annual performance review, sorry, uh, annual performance development review, or whatever it's called now, and it's there. So we, these are the kind of um, part of the, the, the goals that we are, I uh, don't know how legally contractualized they are, but we are certainly obliged to take these on board. Mark and I have written a, a, a much more extended piece for an Australian journal called Discourse, which analyzes this. We've also done a, a, a YouTube video, a not very good YouTube video explaining the argument. Um, but Tim Davis there. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's up there somewhere on the web. Um, what else? We've got increased competition, branding and marketing. Uh, you see these uh, trends inevitably resulting in, in these kind of competition between universities. Hazelcorn calls it a, a, a reputational arms race, which results in a massive emphasis on, on marketing, branding. Um, but in New Zealand, this is particularly around the themes of success, innovation, and entrepreneurialism, and creativity. And you know, that, I think, was the big poster that if you walk out of the Human Sciences Building, faced you. This confronts me every time I walk into the Human Sciences Building. You, I don't know who it's directed at. You are studying at the most innovative university in Australasia, uh, according to, uh, I don't know, the Reuters Top 75. I thought these were kind of fascinating contrasts. These are Massey University's advertising campaign. Um, I am a game changer. I am the new New Zealander. Although you, you could be an advert for dress, deodorant, tampons, I don't know, holidays. <laughs> uh, and here's the quirky New Zealand. So it's a really different way in which we're trying to present ourselves. But we're all competing for you know, export education and so on. Finally, I don't know if any of you read the productivity uh, report, the commission report that was published last month. Uh, it's pretty alarming. It's sort of, I think a lot of it is modeled on the UK um, white paper, success in a knowledge economy. Some of the things that it proposed were, firstly, reintroducing student loans with interest. Uh, sorry, uh, raising student fees, but with uh, uh, interest on the loans. I think the government has distanced itself from that. But the main finding, I think, it was about you know, giving uh, financially competent tertiary education institutes more autonomy, uh, creating many more, allowing a more level playing field so that private providers can come into the field, not necessarily universities, but these sort of things like the College of Tourism and Travel, uh, you know, language schools and so on. And of course, you know, opening up the sector to private providers by eliminating unfair competition, i.e. the fact that only students at you know, registered, recognized universities or tertiary institutions can get government loans for grants. They want to open this up so that even two-year programs, you would be eligible for student loans. So we've seen this in the UK and the United States. It then becomes a source that you know, the private providers come in from Australia and the US and vacuum up all these student loans and often leave students without any qualification at the end. So to end, you know, the question, is commercializing, commercialization redefining the mission of the meaning of the university? Yeah, I, I think, you know, from, I mean, what, what's interesting is that the third mission was once a, a rather peripheral add-on add to the university's mission, and increasingly it's becoming the mission. The tail is wagging the dog, uh, and it's become increasingly hegemonic, and not all of parts of the university can really operate. And I mean, the arts and the humanities, we're, we, don't, we don't produce widgets and things. We can't com easily commercialize our, our wares, although education does a very good job, better than most other faculties, actually. Are we witnessing the corporatization of the university? Yeah, but it's not, it's, it's not that it's being done to us. 
entirely. Very often we're doing it to ourselves. We have senior leadership teams that are big supporters and cheerleaders of many of these processes. They may say, oh, my hands are tied, I can't do anything, but many of them don't mind entering this game. The reputational uh, value added payoff is good for them and, uh, and they like to you know, mingle in these high echelons with policy makers. Uh, you're a very important person if you're in a university which is a million billion dollar enterprise and you're new companies. Are these trends changing academic subjectivities? Well, I don't know, we haven't done real detailed research on that, but I put it this way, it's really hard to resist. If you're a junior academic or whatever, how do you, how do you stand up and say no to these sort of, when you're, your new standards, your conditions of employment, your, the, you know, you've just had your annual performance review and you're told that you must be more productive. So how do you sort of say, no, nah, I'm not going to. Uh, so it does have an effect. University, University business, government relations, relations, the triple helix. Uh, are these relations symbiotic or parasitic? Um, my punchline for the conference on, this anthropology conference on symbiotic anthropologies was I wanted to warn people to wake up to the seductive power of metaphors. And I'm basing it on, on an article by Emily Martin where she looks at all these US school, biology school books, uh, which are supposed to be neutral because they're science. And she, she has all these accounts about the, the egg waits while the active sperm runs up the fallopian tube and the, 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 the best, most fit sperm gets there first. And she was showing how, how even school science textbooks are gendered. And her call at the end was, one thing we can do as critical scholars is wake up these sleeping metaphors. Finally, I mean, again, does all this spell the, the death of the public university? Um, we have a book coming out, an edited book on that. And uh, there is a question mark at the end. I don't, I, my one answer would be to say no. Um, in a way, the public university can't, it can't be allowed to die because it still, it has to exist to fulfill all sorts of functions. And, and even by the new commercializing terms, it has to be in operation to deliver the profitability they want. So we end up with, there's a, there's a, a wonderful book by a group of Australian academics called Zombies in the Academy in which they take the zombie metaphor and they talk about the zombie university and the zombification of teaching. Um, so we're, we're not quite dead, but we're not quite alive after uh, either. And so you, you exist in this never world. Um, and actually, I think for many of us feel that, it, you know, we are, the, the usual trope in the zombie movie is that, you know, the, there's a small last bastion of civilization and you're surrounded by these hordes of flesh-eating monsters. And if you, fall behind and you get eaten up. And I think many people feel that in, in, in sort of certain public sector organizations as well. And on that really pessimistic note, I'm going to end. Thank you.